Good evening, everyone. My name is Bridget Coult. I'm the BCCF project manager, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here to the second of our fall season workshops. I am not going to do this whole thing masked. The BCCF Choral Federation has worked hard through this pandemic to address some of the many issues that are faced by choral musicians. And as many of us return to singing, tonight's topic of masking has been one that needs investigation. But first, I need to say that the BCCF acknowledges with gratitude that we live, work and sing on the traditional and largely unceded territories of many First Nations peoples whose rich cultural heritage surrounds us. A few housekeeping things. We're recording this, so you may choose to have your camera switched off, which usually improves the sound. Uh, and the recording will be found on our BCCF webpage within a few days for your reference. Um, our sound guy is away this weekend, so he probably won't get it up until Monday or Tuesday. Please keep your sound muted. If you've got questions, we would ask that you put them in the chat with a letter Q at the beginning. Um, and you may you might want to hold your questions because I suspect a lot of them will be answered in the course of the session. We have about 180 attendees, so there are no promises about how many questions we can deal with. There will be a sheet available from the a web page that has some links and some references for your follow up and anything in the presentation will be there. We have a few experienced mask people online who I hope will pipe up when needed. Um, there's Ian Bullen from Music Folder. There's Dr. Barbara Allen Bradshaw who makes the, the masks for Phoenix Chamber Choir. I'm very pleased to welcome Joan Fernley, who is a conductor and singer from Ottawa and our Canadian leader in making singers masks. And I'm delighted to welcome singer and singing teacher Fabiana Katz to join me this evening. The plan is to give you as much information as I can and then hand you over to Fabi for the practicalities of singing in a mask. But Fabi, please do jump in if there's something you need to add in the first session. I was going to launch right into masks, but there were a few questions that came up in registration that perhaps should be addressed first. A few people asked about, quote, regulations. And I need to be quite clear that this may have started as a BCCF event, but we're reaching a national and international audience. So rather than talking regulations, which may be regional, I think we need to talk about best practices. For our non-BC friends, the province recently introduced a vaccination mandate, mentioning choirs as one of the groups it applied to. And when the printed version of the mandate came out, it turned out that this was intended to apply to groups of more than 50 people. Instant consternation, what about smaller choirs? BCCF is obliged to remind choirs that they must follow provincial guidelines. But in a recent board meeting, it was decided that we needed to go further and urge best practices, even if the size of the choir does not formally necessitate it. What we are hearing from choirs is that singers are more comfortable knowing that the people around them are vaccinated. And so even though it's not strictly necessary, they're following the mandate and asking for vaccination proof. So the next most frequently asked question is, if we're all vaccinated, why do we need to mask? Well, the sad fact is that vaccinations are not magic. They are astonishing in the way that they urge our bodies to protect themselves, but they are not a shield that will bounce the viruses off us. Any of us can still become infected with the COVID virus in what's called a breakthrough infection. The miracle of the vaccine is that it helps our bodies fight off the infection so that what might be life-threatening becomes merely uncomfortable and inconvenient for most of us. And in the early stages of reacting to that infection, we may not show symptoms, even though we're capable of infecting other people. Masks are the easiest and most effective way of keeping ourselves and others safe. So singing masked while the Delta variant is still in our communities is better than relying on vaccination alone. 
If the numbers go down significantly, that's something we might debate. But for now, stay safe, please. So going to share screen. It's pretty clear from research by many organizations that COVID virus and all its different variants is passed primarily by droplets and aerosols. The droplets are the visible moisture that can be seen when sneezing or coughing. If contaminated droplets land on a hard surface, they can be picked up by touch and the contamination transferred to the face of another person. Aerosols are the droplets that are too small to see, but still carry a viral load. Having clean hands and not touching the face are both a significant protection against catching COVID. However, we now know that such touch contamination is fairly rare, and though we should keep things clean, we actually don't need to be obsessive about cleaning every surface. There are at least five su suggested mitigations um, in addition to vaccination that will help prevent the spread of the COVID virus. These are sanitizing, making sure that all the touchable surfaces are clean, masking, which is the topic for tonight, distancing, which is the recommended space of two meters between singers, ventilation, which is singing in a space in which there is a complete air change several times an hour. This can be achieved by HVAC or by opening doors and windows. And duration, the lower your ACH, the air, the air change per hour, the more important it is that you don't have your singers in that space for too long. More about all these can be found in the video from the BCCF webinar, Back to Singing, from August 2021, as well as the one offered by Choral Canada this summer. And all of these things count as best practices. They are not necessarily required by provincial health, but I think the provincial health folks still don't understand all the concerns of singers. Of most importance to every individual singer is the use of a mask, even when we can't control the other factors. And it's something that we can and should take personal responsibility for. A good mask will prevent the user from the droplets and the aerosols that are emitted by another person. We now know that it's possible to carry the infection asymptomatically and not know that one is infectious. And in this situation, the use of a mask will protect other people from you. Any mask is better than no mask at all. But if it's truly going to be effective, a mask should cover the nose and mouth completely and not have gaps around the edges. Medical professionals, well, let me do it this way. Um, we often find that people are protesting that wearing a mask is too hard. Have I gone two pages? I think I have. Go on here. There we are. Many people, um, especially those in the, in the medical profession, will wear a mask all day. Um, and we'll often hear people protesting that wearing a mask is too hard, but it's, it's certainly possible. Sure, it's less comfortable than going unmasked, but for all except those who are the most breathing compromised, it's the best possible protection that is easily available. Most people with asthma, even if it's severe, can manage to wear a mask or face covering for a short period of time. Wearing a mask has been proven that it doesn't reduce a person's oxygen supply at all or cause any significant buildup of carbon dioxide. Yes, Certainly some face coverings can make breathing feel uncomfortable, but this is mostly because they trap heat. In cooler weather and in places with air conditioning, wearing a face covering can feel easier. And incidentally, face coverings also help protect us from cold and flu germs, and they mitigate the effect of allergens. Flu activity was unusually low through the most recent flu season, and that's attributed mainly to the number of people who were wearing masks. So what sort of masks should we be thinking about? Medical professionals who are working in an infected situation 
uh, so primarily in a COVID ward or an ICU, will wear fitted N95, so KN95 masks. And these are rated to catch 95% of 0.3 micron particles. Among the minor differences, only KN95 masks are required to pass fit tests, while N95 masks have slightly stronger breathability standards. These are not necessary for most people. You only need to consider their use if you're around someone who has COVID or if you haven't been vaccinated and might put others at risk. Effective N95 and KN95 masks will come from a reputable source and there are many bad copies available. Um, they're no use if they don't fit properly. If there are gaps around where they touch the face, um, you're better to think about something else. There are lots of ads for things like scarves or bandanas, and some people like a neck gaiter or a tube scarf, and they're all good for a fashion statement or a cold day on the slopes, but they're not considered sufficient protection from contaminated aerosols. A face shield gives the illusion of protection, and it does in fact protect us from droplets, but it gives no protection against aerosols, which will make their way around the edges. If you're wearing a face mask, you should also be a face shield, you should always also be wearing a mask. Any really good mask is made at least in part from a close woven or fused material. Non woven polypropylene has been found to be the most effective, and the mask should ideally have several layers. The most common mask is the easily dissourced disposable medical mask which is made of this sort of material. On the plus side, it's very easily accessible. You can find them everywhere. On the negative side, it's a one size fits all, which means that for many, it's actually not a really good fit. By the way, we call them disposable, but we are seriously adding to the landfill problem with them. And, and just a recommendation, cut the ear loops before you throw them out. Wildlife can get tangled in your ear loops. Made of similar material, this disposable Canadian made 3D mask for singers is surgical quality, it packs flat with an enhanced fit, and it's said to be comfortable, easy to breathe and to sing through and latex free. It's as light as the weight of a nickel. It's available from musicfolder.com in packs of, packs of five or 50. Ian Bullen, are you there? Do you want to speak to this? Okay, I'm unmuted. Hello, everybody. Yes, um, we we do have those in packs of fifty and uh, in in Ziploc pouches of five, and they are ASTM level three certified, which is a surgical surgical rating. They are a surgical mask, and um, they're really wonderful. They here here I have it opened up. You see, it comes flat like that. In fact, uh, fifty. See, here's an opened pouch. So there's just a whole stack of them. So they're sealed in this box of 50 and you squeeze it down and it's only like that thick for, for a stack of 50. And um, the, the nice thing about them is that they really are 3D and they breathe so well. I guess I should put one on. And particularly for glasses users, I mean, you all know the usual tricks, pinch your nose and so on. Um, I've been jogging in this when we had the smoke in Vancouver, I was out and with the mask on, I couldn't even smell the smoke. So that tells me something incredible. I mean, it's a 98% filtration rate um, and they're just really, really comfortable and really breathable. And they're as, as low as a dollar when you get a pack of 50. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks Ian. Um, like, like many masks, faces are different, so it may not fit everybody but it's, it's certainly easily available through, through Ian's company. I should say, I did a rehearsal last night wearing one of them and I didn't find it comfortable. I wanted to go back to my usual mask, uh, but everybody's different. It's just one of those, one of those things. Um, the primary difference between okay. the medical mask and the singer's one from Music Folder, as Ian says, the medical mask is flat and it has to fit to the contours of the face. Um, and the, the, the mask for singers, though it's packed flat, is constructed and folded in such a way that when it opens, it cups around the face. So it creates space in front of the nose and mouth. Um, and the design is known as a, 
uh, a 3D mask or an origami mask. Both kinds of mask are intended to be worn and then discarded. Um, they can't be washed. They shouldn't be worn repeatedly. Ian tells me that the, his mask, in fact, can be worn repeatedly. But I would imagine you've got to find a way of cleaning it. Um, it's not so much because COVID, but because the warmth of exhalation is a really good breeding ground for minor infections like yeasts and fungus. Um, so don't worry too much about the COVID in terms of cleaning your mask, but it, you need to protect yourself from other things. It's a germy world, folks. Fabric masks are for people, those of us who don't like throwing disposable masks away. This is our alternative. Um, you'll usually find that there are four kinds. There are pleated masks that are very much in the same size as style as medical masks. There are panel masks, which are close fitting over the nose and mouth. There are the 3D or origami masks that allow space in front of the nose and mouth. And there are performers or singers masks, which are made with a structure that offers a lot more space in front of the face. And depending on your face shape, one kind of mask may be more comfortable than another, or it may fit you better. There is no perfect fits everybody mask for singers. Um, one of the things that, that people have been asking is what, what sort of mask should I get? You, you can't tell if different faces are, are need different things. Um, can you see from this one how, how a packet of masks would fit all these people very differently? With the face, how much the face protrudes, um, degree of jaw movement, whether the face is flat, flat or projecting forward, they all affect the act of singing in a mask and they need to be concerned in choosing one option or another. Perhaps less important than the style of, of the mask that you choose, because as I say, any mask is, is better than no mask, but really worth thinking about, important, is to consider what materials are used to make it. Research is showing that the most effective masks are made of a mixture of materials and at least one layer of non-woven polypropylene should be in there somewhere. Your other fabrics should be close woven and washable. Most people find it more comfortable to have cotton close to the skin and a middle layer of polypropylene and then whatever pattern fabric that you want for the outside. Um, quilting cotton is sufficiently close, close, close woven. High count sheet fabric should probably not be used for more than one layer because it's not very breathable. You might be able to work with two layers of non-woven polypropylene and one of natural fabric, but it's not enough just to put a little bit of filter in. The, the non-woven polypropylene needs to be incorporated in the mask. And I'll be asking Joan to speak to that in a little bit. What else do you need to think about in constructing or choosing an effective mask? Um, as Ian says, a nose wire to shape around the nose and prevent warm exhalation escaping upwards is recommended, especially if the wearer also uses glasses. And especially with medical masks, one way of cutting down on the exhalation fog is to use a strip of medical paper tape over the bridge of the nose. Um, personally, I prefer to pre prepare my glasses beforehand with some anti-fog wipes or anti-fog spray. And you can get that stuff in London Drugs and other, other places. Getting a good fitting with differently shaped heads may be achieved with alternative methods of holding the mask on. Um, you might be more comfortable with behind the head fastenings rather than just behind the ears. Um, it depends on your, on your head shape and it depends on your ears. Elastic and adjusting beads are easily available from crafts and sewing stores. Fabric masks. Disposable masks are intended for single use only. Fabric masks should be washed after each wearing. You can use a washing machine, depending on what materials are, perhaps using a mesh bag, a lingerie bag, but I find hand washing is the best. Um, I use hot water and laundry soap. I rinse it well, I hang it overnight to dry. It's not recommended to use a dryer, especially if the mask has no strips and other inserts. The heat isn't good for the non-woven polypropylene and it can pull the mask out of shape. You don't really know, need to go to extreme measures to sanitize masks unless you're in contact with COVID. Good washing is enough. 
and if you're in contact with COVID, you shouldn't be at choir. So let's look at the various types of masks that could be made. I'll ignore the pleated one, which is the format of the disposable medical mask, and it's pretty easy to make for a, a, an amateur sewer. A panel mask can be easily made, and there are lots of patterns available online. Just use Google or YouTube, and you'll find layouts like this. Suggestions are made on this version for different sizing, and these sizings are easily adaptable. It's a good idea to measure your own face, the distance from the bridge of the nose to under the chin, and from the nose in front to in front of the ear, so that you've got the width and you've got the height. If this is your choice of mask for singing, it's advisable to extend the chin length a bit to accommodate an open mouth. You need, if you're going to drop your jaw significantly, what you'll find is that your mask will either stick to the top of your nose and your jaw will come out, or your jaw will drop and you'll pull it down off, off your nose. So you may need a little bit more, a little bit more length in the, in the neck. Many people like the close fitting quality of a panel mat. Many others are not so comfortable with it. And one of the reasons that singers tend not to use this model is that you can inhale or suck fabric into the mouth when you breathe. These are examples of the simplest panel fabric masks, a pleated one on the top and a panel one below. Notice that both of them have non-adjustable ear loops and they're made of standard elastic. You can actually get a softer type of ear loop with adjuster beads from a craft store or through crafters on Etsy. Because these masks lie quite close to the face, it's possible to create space by inserting a plastic bracket over the mouth and nose before putting the mask on. Um, I don't find this entirely comfortable, but it works for some people. Fabi, do you, do you use a, a, a bracket? Well, she may talk about that later. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah okay. Like sorry. I have two different kinds. Um, they, they sweat a little bit. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, origami is the art of folding paper, or in this case, fabric. Um, and being, being what it is, origami gives you different ways of folding the fabric to make slightly different outlines according to the shape of your face. In this diagram, you can see that the final mask in each line looks slightly different. Again, Google and YouTube will lead you to a variety of, of methods for this. It's not the, not the one and only pattern, far from the one and only pattern. This is one of my favorite masks. This is made of a single shape of fabric and the curvature is created by top stitching the folds and or adding stiffening to the front panel. So it's, it has a little bit of a feeling of the singer's mask, but there's a lot of space in front. This is made by Dr. Barbara Allen Bradshaw, who sings with Phoenix Chamber Choir. And she also creates masks in flat panel 3D and a deeper 3D that she, style that she calls the singer's mask. And her website has helpful details in ordering. Uh, she says she's got a very long waiting list at the moment. Barbara, are you with us? Yes. Hi, Bridget. Thank you so much. <laughs> can you guys, can you see me okay? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's great. So yeah, I just as a background, I started making these masks and um, selling them and donating proceeds to my local food bank for the um, starfish pack program for hungry kids. Um, and, it, you know, I'm a physician during the day. So I get to do this at night and spend my off time making these masks. And uh, so I'll just show you. So these are the 3d masks. This is the mask for Phoenix. And um, this is the singers version. So my jaw is completely open and I can sing no problem in this. Um, and the way that these are made is it's from a large single piece of fabric. And just to give you an idea, and I can share with you, Bridget, the website for the template. So anyone can go on there and find this. This is what you'll get on the regular website. For example, this is the standard 3D mask I make for most women. And then what I what we did myself and another colleague in Phoenix we made these for the entire choir uh, after figuring out that we should make this mask taller 
So the blue in the back is the singer's version. It's about one inch taller, and I do that for the ma male and the female versions. And that just allows for that extra vertical distance, um, which is really helpful. And then the other thing we do for these is in the center section, you can see in the center there's basically, sorry, this is hard. I'm going to show you with a different color because it's probably easier to see. There's a seam on the top and a seam on the bottom and that creates this center section and in that section I just insert this flexible piece of plastic canvas which then stops the mask from collapsing into your mouth so you can sing and breathe in as quickly as you want and you can have a forceful inhale and you won't be eating your mask which is what we found when we made the first version and we're trying to breathe and sing at the same time and some of the fabric would suck in depending on the stiffness of the fabric. So then we just, yeah, mask, <laughs> mask eating sucks, I agree. So we, uh, we inserted this, actually my colleague thought of this. So basically this is sitting inside this mask and there's no more fabric eating whatsoever. So this is similar to the um, silicone picture that you showed that you can put into a regular mask. Um, and then these have, you know, we put a nose wire in, they're very good, uh, you know, different sizes. And it's just a small alteration from the regular 3D pattern. So uh, Bridget, I'll share that 3D pattern. It's, it's called uh, Japanese Sewing Books. And it, they have all of the different templates for all of the sizes. Just as a word of note, if you're going to go and do this on your own, they do fit on the small side. So you, um, I use their, I think, large size for women. And they're extra large for men and here's what just the regular one looks like and I find that even actually for kids as well they prefer these 3d masks over over the other uh, panel masks mm -hmm. that I make kid sizes yep they have all the way down to extra small which I use for ages two to four and then they just go up from there so uh, if you want my breakdown of sizes I'm happy to let you know. Um, I do put on my masks, if requested, and most people want it now, a very, very thin layer of polypropylene in between the two layers of quilting cotton. So this, these are three layer masks, although not everybody, you know, you don't have to make it that way. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to show you is that, oh, by the way, yeah, I'm happy to make these for people. However, just note that I do have about a two month waiting list. I've had an and inundate, I've been inundated with orders. So unfortunately my time is limited. However, you can make your own and I can help anyone that wants to do so. Um, if you wanna wait, I'm happy to put your, oh, <laughs> hey John, thanks. I'm happy to put your name on my list and just get to it as soon as I can. I'm maybe about a week or two ahead of schedule. So that's great. The other thing that I often sing with are these, which you can find in most pharmacies and it's a pack of 10 disposable masks. These are the regular surgical sort of shape. Um, however, what I find about these ones versus the regular blue and white surgical masks is that the fabric or material is a lot stiffer. And so I don't suck this in when I breathe and I find this incredibly comfortable to sing in. Um, I also, of course, love my own masks, but you know, these are taking a while to get. So I can, you know, breathe in this no problem, breathe quickly, quickly, and they, they are, they're rigid enough that they hold up. They're probably similar to the material that you have in those other 3D masks mm -hmm. from the music folder, which I haven't personally tried. Um, so those are really good. They are three layer, but they're not rated. I don't see any rating on the packaging in terms of a guarantee for filtration. So I don't know what that, what that guarantee is. The name of the drugstore often option is called SureSafe, and they have two different colors. The black is often sold out, so uh, but you can get it at any pharmacy or shoppers. Uh, I've seen them all over. Um, you just have to find them when they come in. So yeah, so that's it. Um, I'm glad you guys like the masks. That's great. Thanks, Bridget. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so we'll we'll add Barbara's um, resources to the website early next week and then you could find it from there so when we're thinking about performers or singers masks this is probably what most people are thinking about though with more space whoops more space in front um from the beginning of the pandemic when it became clear that people who sang or shouted or 
articulated strongly would also emit more aerosols and droplets, performers sought a way to protect themselves. And the Broadway Relief Project is a coalition of Broadway designers and stitchers that normally build costumes for Broadway hit musicals. And during the pandemic, this team was enlisted and approved by the city of New York to be part of the team creating over 2 million medical gowns for New York hospitals. In 50 de 59 days, the project, which was headquartered in Times Square, built over 51,000 gowns, which went directly to the public hospitals of New York to assist the fight against COVID. And in addition to creating PPE for hospitals, the project has also designed and currently manufactures masks for performers. This is, this is what they call the singer's mask, which is being used by many music makers worldwide. Um, it's a little different from this next one, which is, which is the, the singer's mask as created by um, Ottawa singer and conductor Joan Fernley. Um, she began from, I think, an origami mask base, but added structure, and she's continued to improvise and improve with a purpose cut and designed performer's mask. Um, and what makes her my heroine is that from the beginning, she has been really generous in sharing her experiments and her discoveries with other choral musicians. And her how-to videos may be found on YouTube under Soprano Joan. Her recommended mask at the moment is her version 3. Uh, I don't know if version one still exists, but version three is really good. But every bit as important as the YouTube demonstrations was her mobilization of social media with the creation of a Facebook group called Masks for Performers, which helped sewers or sewists all over the world to create masks for thousands of choirs to sing safely. It's a so-called private group on Facebook, meaning that you need to ask to join it. But it has more than 7,000 members, some of them mask crafters, other people just wanting information. These samples show slightly shallower curve than the New York performer masks, and they clearly demonstrate the boning that creates the frame that keeps the space open in front of the face. For some people following the group, the focus was on creating something beautiful. Choice of fabric was shared, many people continued making masks on the original origami pattern. The back two here are, I think, from that format. Uh, the front two are from Jones version three. Lovely fabrics. For others, the focus was on creating quantity, with complete choirs being equipped with masks to match concert dress. This was 45 masks made for a choir in Ontario. Makers learned to work in teams, almost with an assembly line system. You could find Joan's uh, patterns for Joan's structured masks when you watch her YouTube videos. They're attached to resources. And you can also find them by investigating the FAQ, the, the Frequently Asked Questions section on Mask for Performers on Facebook. As I say, this is a private group, but it's very easy to join. You just request and you answer the questions and the mask world just opens to you. Most recently, Joan has been experimenting with an all polypropylene mask, and she found that it works really well. However, skin sensitivity varies, and you may find that you're more comfortable with the natural fabric that's closest to your skin. Joan, do you want to pop in on this? More than time. Here's the expert. Sure, I can pop in. Um, so hello, <laughs> everyone. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background, this all began in July. So the Broadway performer's mask wasn't actually on the market uh, when I was tasked with finding a way of getting a mask for singers. And even the resonance mask wasn't it was still in prototype. And I thought, my goodness, there must be a pattern on YouTube. And I went on YouTube and all I could find were videos about the singer's mask that, you know, singing teachers tell you about, but not an actual mask. It was very hard to look for that. So my version one was an origami mask. Uh, I basically took an origami pattern and I added more fabric in this area for the chin. So rather than having the regular rectangle shape with the 
corners cut off for the origami mask i had an extra amount of fabric underneath so that it could really wrap around the chin and get a good seal that way from that i actually created version two and version two didn't uh last very long and i went straight into version three so version three is sort of the very popular pattern but a lot of people have tweaked it in their own ways because they prefer the fit by you know doing different things and i've tweaked my own pattern and i want to talk a bit about some of the structural elements so it all began be, i use zip ties i got that suggestion from a costume maker rather than finding boning she said why don't you just buy zip ties so these are the 14 inch and they're about a quarter inch wide. You don't need to get much wider than that. You don't need a lot of strength in your boning. You just need a little bit. So it's sort of a lightweight boning. The other thing that we've been using a lot is horse hair. And this is crinoline. And this is used to put at the bottom of ball gowns and things like that. It's very, very lightweight. It's actually lighter than the crafting uh, petty point uh, that... Um, was shown earlier but a lot of people use that as well so it's been a flurry of activity on the mask for performers page uh, what i've been experimenting with so if you want to see what polypropylene actually looks like i'm going to show it to you so this is a white piece of polypropylene so i'm going to bring it up to the camera and you're going to see it come into focus and you'll see that telltale dimpling uh pattern here so that is classic polypropylene and it's washable uh, but it doesn't like too much heat. You, you could technically go all the way to boiling it, but you don't need to do that. But you don't want to put it in the dryer and you do not want to iron it. You'll, you'll melt it because it's actually plastic. All those, those disposable medical masks are basically a form of plastic, which is why we're not that keen about disposing masks. Um, so what I want to say is that uh, one thing to write down, if you grab a pencil, this particular polypropylene sheet that I showed you is 70 grams per square meter so that's the recommended weight so this is identified you don't have thread count on this you can't actually count threads this is a non-woven it's spun bond non-woven polypropylene and you want 70 grams per square meter a lot of people this in canada it tends to be sold just basically in fabric stores in the sort of an interfacing section in the US, it's much more brand uh, driven. And so the common brands are SmartFab and uh, Olifun. And SmartFab, it's the double weight, and that's about 68 grams per square meter. So it's in the same class. And you can order that in colors, but it just takes a little bit longer. If you, you, know, if you have a fabric store and you can get this, it's quicker. <laughs> it's not very expensive at all. So what I've been doing is using um, at least two layers. So Basically, what you would do is take two layers of polypropylene. This is the center part of the mask. You layer that, and then you would have your pretty fabric on the outside, and you would do that on all pieces of the fabric. And you would want a three-layer mask. A three-layer mask is the Health Canada recommendation. Two layers is no longer considered appropriate. You want to have three layers. That is what Health Canada recommends. That is what the WHO recommends. Um, so really do upgrade your masks, all your masks to three layers. Medical masks that you buy in the drugstore, they look like one layer when you touch them. It looks like one layer, but it's actually a three layer mask. Um, so I think that's it. Oh, yes. So basically, some people may not like having this next to their skin for whatever reason. I have found that it's not been an issue. I made a mask with 100% polypropylene, three layers, and the... And the um, speech intelligibility is actually very good so it's a lot like a medical mask because the polypropylene is very breathable it has super high breathability cotton is a lot less breathable and what ends up happening is it ends up affecting the uh, the acoustics so a mask that has an extra layer of cotton will have much more dampened acoustics so the more breathable your mask is the better the acoustics and so with the polypropylene you get much better acoustic value so what i recommend when you're making a singer's mask is two is at least two layers of polypropylene 70 gsm uh, grams per square meter and then maybe an extra layer of the the quilter's cotton on the outside because you want something pretty you want to match everything or you could put an another layer of polypropylene 
And what I've also suggested is that people, if you don't want to have some the polypropylene close to your skin, you might buy a very, very thin fabric, not for filtration. <laughs> This is just there as a comfort layer next to your skin. This is a cotton silk blend, but it will add warmth to your mask. Even if it's really thin, this extra piece of fabric adds a little bit of extra warmth. So it's always that sort of balancing out your needs, but definitely masks are very breathable. In the early days, back a year ago, September, um, everything all the attention was on filtration let's get the best filtration the best filtration so everybody was buying high thread count sheets and if you make a mask with high thread count sheets you can't breathe and those masks actually will fail the breathability threshold in a lab whatever is considered actually breathable so if in the early days you were wearing one of these super high thread count bed sheet uh masks and you were breathing in and, and the mask was really collapsing on your face and you found it hard to breathe, you're right, it was hard to breathe. Those kinds of masks actually don't really pass breathability tests very well. And that's why the quilters cotton and the non-woven polypropylene have been the two fabrics that have converged. The, the data and the accessibility of the fabrics, uh, we, it's converged to that because those are the most reproducible and the most of available. So I did I answer sort of the, all the questions, uh, Bridget? I think so. I think so. I mean, there will probably be other questions coming up from from people afterwards. But but that covers most of what that, I that 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 wraps it up. So yes, do join mass for performers. I'm not one to push the version three. For me, it's whatever fits whatever is adjusted to your face, whatever gets a really good seal around your face. That's the mask you should be wearing. Different for everyone. Yes, definitely. Let me go back to this. All right. So you've decided that your choir needs a set of masks. Um, makers of fabric masks do post on sites like Etsy, but there you're usually talking about just one mask at a time. If you want to order a full set of masks for a choir, you need to go to a maker on Joan's list um, or to one of the commercial makers of performers masks. Um, and I would suggest you go to a maker on, on Joan's list. Uh, alternatively, you can put together a sewing team from singers and friends and work from one of the many patterns that are available. The most economical way, because let's face it, a lot of us are in budget shock at the moment this year. Um, we, we've had a year of not making music and we've probably got reduced choirs, so reduced membership. If you don't have the budget to allow that, and if uniform appearance is important to you, the most economical way to mask everybody uniformly is to allow them to wear whatever works best for them in rehearsal and switch to one kind of disposable mask for concert, either a blue medical mask or Ian's black one. Um, but it would be so nice to have fancy masks, beautiful, beautiful masks on Joan's pattern. Those of us who have already started rehearsing in masks are discovering some of the challenges that are involved. I remind my choir that singing in a mask is better than not singing at all. And I know they agree, but still. So I asked Fabiana Katz to join us for a practical slant on what can make masked singing easier and what we need to be careful about. Fabi sings with Vancouver Chamber Choir, which sang its way through last season, masked with enormous care. Um, she knows from hard experience that masked singing is different from unmasked. She also directs Richmond Singers, a women's choir, who've just begun rehearsals like many of us, and who are also facing the questions about what masks to wear as well as all the other mitigations that we need to consider. Fabi, over to you. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to talk about this. So I won't say much about masks because you've heard everything that uh, was there to say about the making of masks. Um, I wanted to show you my little pack of masks so over you know, like everybody else, I've been looking for for the right thing that feels comfortable and, and doesn't get sucked into my face when I breathe. 
So I have this in my purse with me at all times. Um, I have a couple of the ones that um, they you talked about. This is that black uh, surgical mask. Um, I have another one which is is like the singer's mask that that Ian sells, but I'm it's probably it, it's not that, but it's that same shape. Um, it it feels a little flimsy actually, but uh, uh, for a little while I guess it's okay. One thing that I wanted to say is that don't think don't um, uh, feel the need to wear the same mask for the whole rehearsal period, for example. They get very sweaty, it gets very hot. So I carry a whole bunch of masks and sometimes I use one, one half of the rehearsal and another uh, half of the rehearsal. I have two masks that were made by Barbara. I really like them. Uh, this is my black mask for performance. And uh, I find it very, very comfortable. It feels quite well. There is a, a, you know, like all masks, actually, a little bit of, of muffling that happens. So uh, you have to uh, um, deal with that. And then I got another one just recently. And this one feels maybe, maybe a little bit, perhaps just a little bit bigger. Yeah. Um, they're very, very comfortable and very breathable. And I really like them. Plus, one of my... Um, singers, one of the singers uh, of the Richmond Singers. Um, I don't know if Linda Hicks is here tonight. If you are, maybe you can say hi, but she's been making uh, quite a few of the singers uh, uh, so, and she's been making these ones. She's gonna, she made a bunch for the choir. It's the same concept, but like um, Jean's mask, it has a, a bigger, longer piece down here. So, it's cover actually there's uh it's it's quite nice it's not it's not uh very muffled down. um you can pinch it here um the way that the loops are constructed and the the um elastic comes from the front keeps the mask flush against your face here which some of the other ones don't sometimes they tend to buckle and do this um so this is good plus um it's it's got a really nice space for breathing and uh, um, it goes under your chin. And so, that's, that's Joan's patterns, Fabi. So okay, it's got, it's, great. it's got the structure in it. Okay, so th that would be the uh, th version three then. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's version three. And oh, in okay. some instances, some people will put elastic or oh, not. Depending oh, on, so it, there's been a lot of different variations for the chin area. So yeah, that's uh -huh. definitely version three. Great. <laughs> So well, these are very, very comfortable. They have a lot of space. They don't muffle the sound. They're wonderful. Like I said, I myself, I like the smaller mask because um, first of all, with the chamber choir, we read a lot of music and sometimes you see this bulky thing. Uh, at the very beginning, Stephen Bellanger, the manager of the chamber choir, bought um, maybe it was the Broadway singer's masks. I'm not really sure. And perhaps um, he, he bought... Um, I have a small face, but he didn't buy small. He bought medium and large, and I found it really big. And I just, I couldn't see my music past this big thing here, right? So I, I don't like them to be too big for that reason, because then there's always something distracting you here. But that's another personal thing. You asked me about brackets before, and early on I found these, which are a hard plastic, and they're supposed to hook onto the pleats of the surgical mask, but they never stay. However, uh, they don't stay hooked. However, the mask, the it, it does stay in place and it's it makes the singing really quite comfortable actually. Um, it does move around a little bit when you open your mouth, but for the most part, uh, it's it, it keeps the mask away from your face, which is nice. It does tend to open a little bit here um, then I found these ones, which are soft silicone, and you put the loop through here so they won't move. Yeah, it's kind of hooked to the, it's not pretty, but it's functional. Um, and it does the same thing. Yeah, and um, it won't, it, it's a little softer, it won't move, but I found that the silicone turns, tends to, um, 
sweat a little bit the condensation from the singing mm -hmm. ends up on the inside of the i mean it, it happens with both of these by the way so i bought a whole bunch of brackets and again i changed them because over the course of 20 minutes half an hour you end up with a whole bunch of condensation on the inside of the bracket and it feels hot and it feels humid and also it's it's probably not very nice for the skin you know you get rashes you get red anyway so like has been said you have to find um the thing that's comfortable that fits you that you feel that you can breathe um so that's it for sort of the masks that i i wear and like i said i i have this packet in my purse at all times i also have when i go shopping if i'm not going to wear it too long i found this this is a hard visor and i really like this of course, the aerosols, you know, they do get on the hip, but you can see the condensation here. So most of the stuff kind of stays here. But if you're not very close to people and you're, I don't use it for singing. Um, and, and it isn't 100% safe, but that's something else that um, it's nice. And you can see your face. I, I use it when I go shopping. You know, I stay away from people and they can actually see my ugly mug and... Uh, um, you can relate to people a little bit more. So that's it about masks. Now, in terms of um, singing with a mask, um, I found, a, uh, of course, like everyone else, I, I, I did a bunch of research and I, I, I found an article that I found quite useful that touched on a lot of the points that, that I had been thinking about. Um, by a Susan Butterfoss, Butterfoss, I think, and, and that's going to be uploaded on the website as well. So it's already can, there. It's already there, um, and I you can I can also share my my notes from tonight because all the exercises and the things that I I will talk about are there, and I've sort of added a little bit to that article as well. Um, although singing with a mask could cause you to develop unhealthy compensatory habits. There is also a potential, if we do this responsibly, of becoming more mindful of vocal technique and developing or strengthening healthy singing habits that will improve your voice production with or without the mask. So this is a really good opportunity. Of course, you've noticed a few things when you sing with your mask. It feels like your voice is contained inside the mask and it doesn't, doesn't project. Um, so it feels like you're singing right here into your hands. Um, there is very little acoustical response from the space around you because, of course, the, the waves are not free to just kind of travel at the speed and with the intensity that they normally do. They have to get through that, through that barrier. Um, it's more difficult to open your mouth without the mask shifting. Um, and, of course, reduced decibel levels, you know, uh, your sound just feels much softer. Um, there's also weakened frequencies, and this is quite important. Uh, um, in other words, there are some frequencies which don't project as easily. Um, they're in the range uh, from 2,000 to 7,000. We speak in the range from uh, 400 through, I can't remember exactly, but the, the things that are affected at the 2,000 to 7,000 hertz range are the unvoiced consonants. So they all fall in this range. So the things, the, the sounds that get compromised are ch at the lower end of this, at the 2000 frequency. It doesn't matter what the frequency is, but it's the sounds ch and sh. And then at a little higher frequency, we have p and h and g, so the g, the h, h. And then we have k, the k. And then at the very top, around 7000, we have f, f and s. And we know that those sounds are very hard to hear at the best of times. And now with a mask, they hardly come through. So the higher the frequency, the harder it is to hear them. It's why most people seem to be mumbling when speaking through the mask, right? You need to increase your attention to initial and final positions of these sounds in your articulation, especially when singing, beginnings of words and ends of words, especially with these unvoiced consonants. Um, vowels and, and voice consonants like 
Mm, mm, any consonant that you can actually sing through, v, v, z, right? They will carry and, and always be perceived stronger and they will be understood better than unvoiced consonants. So this is true without the mask. So this is an important point when you're thinking about technique and I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. Um, right now I'm discussing sort of the things that we notice. So the voice is contained, it's difficult to open the mouth, there's very little acoustical response, your sound is softer, some frequencies are um, compromised. Diminished word boundaries, right? Becomes harder to um, understand when one word ends and the next one begins. So in this way, we need to be really mindful about articulating, uh, articulating the beginning and the ending of, of words. Um, but you have to be watchful of habits that can hurt you, such as harsh or abrasive vocal onset, like ah, that kind of sort of attack on a sound, closing the throat, um, bumping the chords together really hard. Uh, pushing your sound, trying to sing too loudly, right? These are all the sort of detrimental responses to the mask. And I'm going to get back to this a little bit later when we talk about exercises or things to watch out for. And then finally, the blocked facial cues, right? We can't see the mouth. We can't read. We, it's funny. We never, I, I don't think we realize how much we, we, we read lips, you know, as well as, as, as facial cues and, and the oral cues. Um, it's much harder to understand people. And if like me, I mean, I've been in Canada for 41 years. I, I, I've been speaking English longer than I have been speaking Spanish, but it's still my second language. And it's much harder for me to understand people with a mask. Much harder um, as a sort of a, you know, a, a second languager, let's call it. So that makes a big, a big difference. So here are some things that you need to watch out for. The, the single most important thing about what you're doing and what to be conscious of when you're wearing your mask is the breath. The breath is most important. It's the fuel. It's the fuel. And I, I hope you understand by, by fuel, and this is the teacher and me coming out, it doesn't mean that we're using a lot of breath when we sing. It means that we need it in the body because we use it to create pressure. This is a very, very important distinction. Because I think a lot of us don't quite understand, at least I didn't for a while, that distinction that we're not blowing air, we're not using air with the sound. It's required for us in the body so that we can create pressure against it with our intercostal muscles and with our lower and upper abdominals. So having the breath is huge. And the way that we um, draw the breath at the best of times without a mask, is not often right with a mask is crucial. So without the breath as energy, none of the points can be addressed in a healthy way. All the stuff that I just mentioned, you know, the um, diction and resonance. I haven't talked about resonance. So if the way that you breathed before was always important for singing, it is especially true and doubly so when using a mask. I have to say that I feel like I'm getting about a quarter less air through the mask than I am used to. You know, I, I notice it because my phrases are shorter. You know, I find that I, I just have to breathe a little bit earlier and it takes me a little bit longer. Um, so I do that, you know, um, in a choir, that's a nice thing. You know, you can take time out. There's, there's other people carrying your part. As a soloist, it's a bit of a different issue. But in the choir, if you do it strategically and, and you have um, a method, then you, you can take that little extra time for you to get um, a fuller breath without feeling that you need to suck it. I don't really feel um, my breath compromised uh, generally during the day if I'm just going about my business or just talking. Um, I'm thinking of my mom-in-law who always complains that she just can't breathe, she just can't breathe, she just can't breathe. And I think more of it is, you know, psychological, it's that having that thing in front of your mouth. But it is true that it compromises it a little bit. So learning to breathe properly, whether you're a singer or not, you know, consciously, the way that you do in yoga is very important. Um, when you are breathing to sing with a mask, you must, must ensure that you don't panic. 
like I was saying, my mom-in-law does, and you try to suck the air from the throat, making that noise that I just made. This response is the opposite of what you're looking for. Yeah, it basically makes all the muscles of the system tight. It closes the throat. It, it, it contracts you and in effect defeats the purpose of a more energetic breath. So I will talk more about that. It is crucial that you learn to use your costal breathing. And this is just talking, thinking about the breath. That is the impulse for the breath must come must be born in the ribs. We talk a lot about the diaphragm and that's fine, but as long as you know that you're dropping the diaphragm, that you're relaxing, that you're not tensing it upwards as you're taking your breath, if your diaphragm is relaxed, if your belly is relaxed, then once you know that the impulse for the breath as a singer has to come from the ribs, okay? What you need to do is make space, space for the breath. You don't think about the breath itself. You think about the space that you're creating for the breath. Space through the ribs for the lungs to expand. My go-to trick has always been that sense of surprise. You know, and you can test it right here, right? If you, the moment you think about being surprised by something, right, you go like that. And if you notice the first thing that happens is that you draw a breath, whether you want to or not. It's part of the surprise, yeah? The other one is the feeling of having to sneeze. If you think back, if you try to find that sensation that you have when you think you want to sneeze, right? What happens? You draw a breath, right? Right? So everything opens. So both of this, these physiological responses open the eyes, Raise the brows, expand the sinuses, all of the sinuses, expand your throat, lift the soft palate, drop the larynx, drop the diaphragm, and expand the back. Now, if you try to remember all these things, right, in a moment of the breath, well, you'll never take a breath, right? There's absolutely no time. But I've been trying to teach my, 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 my choirs and my singers for the past 30 years, right? You have to think of the surprise and you have to sing from that place or the sneeze. I love the sneeze. The sneeze is great. It's a little bit more relaxed, um, a little bit more finessed. There's a less of a chance that you're going to go <gasps> with a gasp, which is not what we want because that's the sound of a high larynx and a closed throat. Same thing, right? But the sneeze, immediately, the first thing that happens is that the pharynx opens and the larynx lowers and the soft palate comes up, right? So this is how you want to sing, for starters. And this is the breath that you want to draw. So all of you need to practice that feeling and then always remember to remain in it as you're breathing and singing. These are all conditions, all these things that I mentioned, opening the eyes, expand, expanding the sinuses and the throat, lifting the soft palate, dropping the larynx, dropping the diaphragm. By the way, that will just happen. You don't think about that. The diaphragm takes care of itself. The expansion of the back. These are all conditions for proper, relaxed, deep, full breath. What they are not is noisy, contractive, gaspy, raspy, panicky sucky right yeah it's a it's a it's a feeling of relaxation right rather than than um i don't know what the opposite word contraction right so this is this is the thing about the breath that you need to take when you have the mask and you have to develop that as a discipline you have to practice it you have to consciously be conscious and think about it in your music every time you have a breath. And I used to write it in, I used to write sneeze or surprise every time I had a breath mark in my music. Every time, every time. You look at my early scores from whatever, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and you'll see surprise and sneeze like five or six times per page. Because I needed to remind myself, as you know, every time I took a breath because I would forget. So it needs to become second nature. Very important how you breathe, okay? This thing is not gonna work through the mask, all right? Second, 
So that's the first thing is the breath. Second, louder is not better. It wasn't without the mask and it's not with the mask. Louder, especially if you're using more air to get louder, right? Then not only that is, is well, it will exhaust you. It puts undue pressure on the cords. It doesn't allow you to create the, the sort of ace, um, isometric contraction relationship that you need with your abdominal muscles because the moment you're blowing air, all those muscles come up, right? So, and louder never comes from pushing more voice. It's all about the resonance. So you have to work on finding, nurturing, feeding the resonance, recognizing it, knowing where you're going to feel it, where those sensations are. So instead of volume, you need to focus your attention on the resonance in your articulatory precision. So <laughs> a very good space to, um, place to uh, um, stumble on my words. So we will do a few exercises in a few minutes. Another point is um, finding your clear vocal quality. So it's not about getting louder or, or more intense. You have to get clear, right? You have to make your voice clear. So you need to work on improving the quality of your voice and your phonation. Phonation is the moment of inception of the sound when the chords are drawn together and they vibrate. Of course, this depends on a number of synchronized systems working together in the body, as speaking does. But the best shortcut that I have found that I can give you um, is to notice, notice how you speak yeah? easily and clearly with a set intention. So you can say things like, oh, 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 hello, hi, how are you? Or count one, two, three, four, it doesn't matter. You can try a million phrases. It doesn't matter what it is. You can read a book out loud. You can read a newspaper, an invoice, um, say the numbers, the alphabet. But you just need to notice how clearly and easily your chords phonate. Yeah? You have to get in touch with the sensations and then sing that way. So, and by sensations, it's not only sort of there's sensations in the throat, there's sensations in the resonators and there's sensations in in the abdomen every time you make a sound right so the west the best way to find that clarity is to speak with your clear voice and then mimic that when you're singing so if you're saying oh hello oh hello right and then you turn that into oh hello oh Hello, that is the easiest, most natural, organic way to make a sound. Most of us tend to want to go, oh, hello, right? Immediately, we're trying to help the mechanism. That, that is not healthy singing. Um, too many of us change the way we produce our sound when, when singing, thinking that the singing voice is different from the speaking voice. It's, it's not like that, not like that at all. So along with a clear voice quality is the efficiency and the clarity of speech articulation. And this is, I find this really fascinating. So stick with me for a bit here. Too many times when we ask singers to articulate diction, why, what do we get, right? We get, right? That's, that's not clear articulation. That's just, there's so much tension there that you really, there's no energy left over for anything. So efficient diction and articulation is not in the exaggeration of the vowel shapes. It's in the crispness and efficiency of the consonants. So it's not the vowels at all that permit us to have clear diction. I always think that, you know, the vowels carry the sound, but the meaning is in the consonants. Because without consonants, what do you get? right I mean it could be anything the the consonants are what um, is important is in the crispness in the efficiency and there's an added bonus to that is that any crisp tight tight is a dangerous word but there's there needs to be a certain tightness a certain tonicity 
to our articulation of the language, will connect you to your support. If we're ignoring the consonants, we're ignoring our support. If you try any consonants, right? If you go b, 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 and feel your belly, you will notice that there's energy and action there. And it doesn't matter what the consonant is, right? K, t, f, sh, k. It all comes from the body, right? So if we ignore them, then we're ignoring that part of our support. What we need to do is learn to make our consonants strong, crisp, clear, and with the most efficient use of air. And that implies a certain level of relaxed tension. Yeah, yeah, because it, it, there is a certain tonicity, like I said, but you have to be relaxed, yeah, like, like regular speech. This involves learning intimately how consonants are made in the mouth and with what surfaces. Consonants always include two surfaces. They're made between two surfaces in your mouth. And that's why we always call them. And I'm, I'm going to share a screen right now. Okay. So this is why we call them uh, by these names. I think that there's, I can use a little spotlight here. Here we go. So right here, bilabial, meaning that they're made with the two lips. They can be labiodental, meaning that they're made with the tongue, not with the, um, with the teeth and the lips. Linguodental, right? The tongue and the teeth, you get, you get the, the, the gist. Lingual alveolar, between the tongue and the alveolar ridge. Lingual palatal, which is made with between the tongue and the, like a T, well, oh, that's alveolar ridge, and the palate. Lingual alveolar, between the tongue and the alveolar, uh, the, um, the, the back alveolar here, and then glottal, okay? So this is really quite fascinating. When I started working with the staff, I've, I've been sort of aware of this for a very long time and, and very consciously working my diction this way. It's very interesting because if you think about it, if we start over here, for example, bilabial, the, the thing about consonants is that for example, you have four consonants that are made in the same place, but with different degrees of tension, with different degrees of pressure. So for the most pressurized, you have b, b. A slightly less pressure, you have b. And that's a, that's a phonated consonant. B is not phonated, right? We can't actually sing through it, but b, we can sing through that. Then you have m which is not as tight and you're allowing your lips to resonate, m. And then we have a w, which is an approximate because your lips don't actually come together. So between these two surfaces, we have b, b, m, w, for example, right? Then if we move back, we have labiodental. So um, it's the upper teeth and the bottom lip, you get the f, f, which is a fricative, which has no sound, and then v, which is resonance, right? With a different degree of tension. Uh, between the teeth and the tongue, you have and th, voiced and non-voiced. And this is what you'll get. You get a partner that's unvoiced and a partner that's voiced. Um, I can't see this here. Then we have t and d, s and z. These all are happening. Look at how many consonants you have between the tongue and the hard alveolar ridge, which is your hard palate, which is that little ridge right behind the top teeth. And these are all either voiced or unvoiced with different degrees of pressure. You have t, d, s, z, ch, j, n, and l. They all happen in the same place, but all different degrees of pressure. I find it's fascinating. I love it. Then we have the, the middle of the palate, you have s and I, can, I forgot what that first one is. You have z, no, z, z, you have z, oh, there we go. Z and z, r and j. And then farther back here at the uh, lingual alveolar, the soft palate, you have k, g, and ng, right? And then finally at the glottis, right, right between the chords, you have g, uh, you have h, the h, and then you have g, the, the um, sorry, the uh, the glottal stop. Uh, uh, uh oh, uh oh, 
very easy to learn how to do that with an uh oh. Anyway, so you don't need to be obsessive about it, but if you become intimately acquainted with these feelings, your diction becomes very efficient, very clear, very crisp, mostly efficient. And that is a fantastic way to help your diction through the mask. Okay, phrases like double bubble, double bum, bubbles double are very hard without that kind of practice and knowledge. Double bubble gum bubbles double, or bippity boppity bippity boo, or a big black bug bit a big black bear. Yeah, if we're inefficient with those sounds, it's a lot harder to get them out. Um, any tongue twister, you know, those are great. That's why those are great. So vowels are more contained than we think them to be. And, and this is something you have to be careful while wanting to open your mouth too wide. Um, in, a, in a way, it's actually good that some of these masks don't allow you to go. Because that is not a very good way to sing, to have your jaw, to push your, down your jaw as far as it'll go, you know. Um, first of all, at, at the, it's like the point of diminishing returns at some point point that open space begins to close the back and you can you can do this find out this out for yourself if you open your mouth too wide you'll feel choked at the back right so um you have to learn to create space inside without open your jaw too much um think about the vowels and uh, notice that you can go from a a e without the need to spread your mouth the tongue needs to do the work. It rises and it widens and moves slightly forward in the mouth as you go from A to E. So, A, E, 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 E. That's the work of the tongue. So we didn't need to go A, E, E, right? Which is not very good singing. And you can go A, O, without moving your tongue by allowing your lips just to round and gather in the front. So there's really not much need to open the mouth too much or to create a lot of movement. Yeah, it's all about the tongue and the efficiency of the diction with the consonants. Okay, it's more about awareness of position, shape, and degree of tension. Yeah. So having said that with a mask, you need to pay attention to the unvoiced, you, the voice consonants too. You need to be aware of that resonance and we'll do just a few quick exercises. Um, but the unvoiced consonants are the ones that don't travel, that don't project, the ones that we always miss. So you need to pay more attention to these. Um, vocal hygiene is important. You need to stay hydrated, don't scream raise your voice, push your voice through the mask for a long time, um, you know, all the stuff, alcohol, too much coffee. And uh, before you sing, probably stay away from the usual things, sugar, uh, milk, chocolate, lemon too. You know, we think of a nice thing of water and lemon, but lemon is an acid and your throat won't like it and it will produce phlegm to um, counter that and to defend it itself from the acid. So in some people, lemon can cause phlegm as well. So what you need to do is cultivate your attention to physical sensations like resonance. Sing by feel, not by ear. Concentrate on the sensations of resonance and vibration, right? Pay attention to the consonants that allow your sound to come that way like v and v and mm, 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 right and then feed them nurture in them enjoy them right give them give them that energy sing through them stay aware of the energy of intention and intention in your abdominal area as well as your ribs and your back okay for me this is infinitely more important as maintaining your back open will somatically engage your abdominal wall. So I don't think so much about my abdomen in my, um, in my diaphragm, because when I'm thinking with my back, the front happens, the reverse is not true, yeah? 
If you think about opening your ribs and breathing into your back, you will notice that your front engages, but the reverse isn't true. You can think about, uh, if you think about abdomen and diaphragm getting contracted, you're not necessarily gonna open the back. And you need to expand the ribs because that's where the lungs are, right? That's where the lungs draw breath. So they need, they need room. Your abdomen should feel toned, but not tight. You know, it's the sensation that you get in your abdominal area when you have a surprise reaction or when you are ready to sneeze. Yeah, same thing, right? If you think about that, everything just sort of, right? It's called an eccentric contraction, yeah? And the important thing is that this should remain consistent while you're singing. So if you think of the sneeze and you feel that sort of girdle energizing in your body, you have to maintain that. You have to maintain that, or they're surprised, yeah? You have to maintain that when you sing. Learn to look and enjoy, look for and enjoy the looseness in your jaw and your tongue. Feel that space that you create when you inhale through the surprise or the sneeze, and then maintain that space while you sing, right? That's how your voice changes like that. It's like, no, you don't say, oh my God, oh, right? That's, that's kind of the heightened speech that we get to when you go, oh, you can hear it in the voice as soon as I think of the surprise or as soon as I think of the sneeze. There's this lift that happens everywhere and it just raises the voice. It gives you more resonance. It heightened, heightens the sound and it brings it forward, which is what you want when you have that mask. Sabi, I could what hear a whole nother workshop coming up. Yeah. This. Um, yeah. Right. We need to get people in with their masks and and do some do some hands on some voice okay. on stuff. Yeah. We do need to leave some time for questions, and we're we're really tight on time at this okay. point. Do you want to do some exercises? Anything, anything urgent? I think we need to allow them to to do some questions. Okay. We Perfect. theoretically we were only going through to eight thirty. Okay. I'm going to this the the, the exercises were next. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, I can put the I could put you can put these up, and and people can can go through these and and see if they make sense. And if not, they can um, they can get back to me. Yeah, I'm I'm fairly accessible, and ask questions about it if anything's confusing. So yeah, so questions. Let's let's see how we're doing. Uh, if there are questions, please put them in the chat. Um, if we've got if we've got time at the end and Fabi is ready to do a few exercises with people who want to hang on, then then we could do that. But uh, I do need to leave a little bit of time for for people to ask. So stick it in the chat. Put a, put a queue in front of it if you if you've got time. Um, and I've got Kathy, I think, watching for what's what's there. Well, perhaps you don't have any questions. Uh, Bridget, yes. Um, if you want, I can show some uh, what uh, Fabiana was talking about the uh, how the consonants are affect you know across the different frequencies. And there's there's some findings from a study that I can pull up very quickly if uh, if nobody has questions. And it's a really good way of actually seeing what happens. Um, do you want me to show that? Sure. If you you've got it on your computer there. Yes, let and I can, make, but you, you need to your... let me oh, share my screen. <laughs> Another one. Ah, there we go. Excellent. And I'm going to go right down to the end. And so this is a study from uh, Corey from the journal um, of acoustic oh I can't remember the title of the journal but and it dates back from October 2020 and it shows a number of different masks uh, you've got surgicals you've got KN95 uh, N95 there's a number of window masks and a shield and then below in the second table uh, graph here you have various uh, fabric combinations. And um, what's interesting to see is that the just this, this is completely consistent with what Fabiana was saying, but it's really nice to actually see the graphs and see the data. And you can see where the vowels are produced. It's roughly between something like 400 and 2000 
give or take. And what you're seeing on the Y axis, the vertical axis, it's the, it's the sound loss, the attenuation in decibel levels. And if you're at zero, you're pretty much on par with no mask. And so, you know, on, for vowels, you don't lose much decibel production. But then if you look at the consonant, the unvoiced consonants, just like Fabiana says, the T's and the S's, especially those, they tend to be much higher pitched. This is Hertz over here on the lower X axis. And this is where you start to get sound dropping off. So it's really uneven. In the vowel area, you don't lose much decibel value, but in the, um, in the consonant, the unvoiced consonant area and the higher pitches, you actually lose quite a you get quite a bit of sound uh, attenuation so not only are vowel of uh, consonants not as loud to begin with they're the ones that get the most attenuated now the other thing that's worth mentioning is uh when it comes to window masks and shields they're the worst <laughs> they're the worst um they will uh, you get actually what's really interesting, this uh, yellow line is the shield and you get this peak of um, an increase in volume, which is really weird. And then you get a massive decrease in volume and in the very high pitches you get this seesaw up and down of the attenuation in decibels and it can create a distortion in sound. So window masks, as much as it provides cues, it actually really messes with the sound and it sends the sound backwards and it lets your face absorb it on top of everything. Because the window and the shield are actually a wall. There's, there's nothing that allows it to go through. So what you're actually hearing is the sound coming through the sides. So anyway, whoops. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> so I, I thought that might just be a really interesting way of demonstrating it. What, what's interesting to see also is that the surgical mask, which is this green line with circles, is actually very similar to a cotton two-layer mask, which I found very surprising. It's not really my experience, but this is this is one study, and the sound came from a loudspeaker, and it was picked up by a microphone about two meters distance. So there you go. That's that's what I thought might be useful and I'll stop I'll stop sharing. How do yep. I stop sharing? Uh hang on. Bridget, you know what I can do is I can I can um, record some of these exercises and um and share a, a YouTube link. Okay. You know, with okay. the mask. That would be good. And and then that that would be another way to um to do those with some guidance. Sure. Thank you. Um, Mary's asking whether the material is or needs to be disinfected in the first place. You mean before making, Mary? I wouldn't have thought it was necessary. What's your experience, Joan? Um, I would say no. Um, I, I think um, by the time you receive the mask, some time has gone by. Many, Although it is a good idea to wash it, um, but again, words like washing, disinfecting, sanitizing are words that actually carry some regulatory value and they actually mean something from a regulatory perspective. So when you ask a scientist, uh, you know, should I be sanitizing my mask? They'll sit there and say, well, it depends. So really uh, a hot wash is the Health Canada recommendation. And I've spoken to some epidemiologists and they're like a hot wash is fine. Uh, I've I boiled masks just out of curious, you know, because out of scientific curiosity uh, or I've washed them in like 60 degree. A hot wash is considered about 50 to 60 degrees centigrade. You can't actually touch that with your hands, but you can you can actually measure temperature and you can actually wash your mask a little bit of soap, hot water, stir it around, agitate it. That's another part of washing. It's soap, temperature, and agitation and time. That's how, those are the four factors uh, when it comes to washing. And you swoosh that around for a while, and then you rinse it thoroughly. You don't, you know, especially if you have a bit of perfume in your, in your laundry soap, you really want to rinse that out a lot so you're not breathing in perfume and then hang it to dry. So that's what I would do. Anybody else? I, think I see Ian's got his hand up. 
Ian. I was just going to throw everyone a little bit of a benefit and I was going to pop that in the chat button. I've set up a coupon code for a $5 discount on a box of 50 okay. for everyone. So don't a thousand, well, if a thousand of you take that, then well, great. But anyway, there you go. Thank <laughs> I'll put you. The link in the chat, that's all. Well, it is past 8.30, and if there are no other questions, I mean, you could always get in touch with, with me, or I can pass things on to, to Joan or to Fabi for you. Um, I am going to say thank you for being with us this evening for our, our session on masks and masking. Uh, the BCCF board met last week, and we're looking at some possible further events for later in the fall, though nothing's pinned down yet. So please check our website or like BCCF on Facebook to stay up to date with what comes next. Our communications guy, as I say, is actually out of communication this weekend, so I'm not sure when the recording will be edited and posted, together with all the resource material and the things that Fab is offering, but I hope it'll be there early in the week. My thanks to Ian, to Barbara, to Joan, and especially to Fabi for all the information they've shared with us this evening, and to BCCF board members Liana Savard and Kathy Pereira for being in the background so that I didn't need to worry about Zoom tech. I want to reiterate, know your local health regulations, but also remember that they may not understand singers and their concerns. I don't think our BC health folks do. Hold to best practices, know the things that will protect your group most effectively, and don't be ashamed of caution when the local COVID numbers rise. I'm going to say good night, everyone. Please wear your masks and stay safe. <laughs>